Hello, my name's Phil Parnham. I'm a chartered building surveyor. And in this video, I want to talk you through how I approach carrying out inspections of residential property. Although I like to think uh, that I follow best practice, this is not a definitive guide. This is just how I prefer to do it. And hopefully, this will give uh, those people who are new to residential surveying a helpful and useful guide. This video is titled Arriving at the Property and it covers a number of uh, distinct areas. For example, the sort of things to do before you actually visit the property. Also, arriving at the property and what I call setting the agenda for the inspection. And then finally, inspecting an empty property and an occupied uh, uh, property with particular focus on health and safety matters. I won't be covering the diagnosis of specific defects or other property problems in this video. Instead, I'll focus on the process of the inspection itself. Assuming you have received instructions from a lender or directly from a private client, there are a number of things you should do. First, find out as much information about the property and its owner and or occupants as possible. This may sound like stating the obvious, but things like the number, property name, the postcode are particularly important. That can save you endless amount of time driving around a neighbourhood looking for a particular house. Also, the name and phone number of the person responsible for the property. Now, this could be the owner themselves, uh, you know, a landlord, or maybe even their agent. And finally, if the property is occupied by a tenant or other authorised person, then you need the name of the person you'll be meeting at the dwelling together with their contact number as well. For example, just in case you're late or delayed on, on the road. You should then arrange access, making sure the occupier gets your name, your contact number, preferably a mobile, uh, who you work for, what you will be doing once you get there and how long it will take. Letting them know an estimate of the time in the house is very important because really you don't want to be halfway through your inspection only to discover the occupier as an urgent appointment and wants you to leave immediately. But the last surveyor only took 10 minutes is a phrase many practitioners have heard before. So try and avoid that happening. Once the inspection has been arranged, you'll need to let your office know what you'll be doing. Typical information could include the name of the client, of the occupier, and their contact details. Nature of the job, you know, whether it's a home buyer report or a condition report of, of, of various types. Uh, the date and time that you uh, intend to start the inspection and about how long you expect to be at the property. Once you have completed the inspection, you should let your office know that it's complete, even if you're going on to another job or going home at the end of the day. This is because you could possibly become ill or fall over or sustain an injury in an empty property and may need some help or assistance. You should discuss with your colleagues what to do if they don't hear from you. If you are a sole trader uh, or practitioner that works on their own, you may not have an office or close colleagues with whom you can easily communicate. Although this will present a number of problems, you still need to set up similar arrangements with someone. This could be through a commercial relationship with another small business or possibly a reliable family member or friend. Whatever solution, you must have some sort of process of protecting your own health and safety. So here I am pulling up at the property. Although it should go without saying, your car should be in satisfactory condition and regularly maintained. You should drive safely and particularly uh, ensure that you have a sensible schedule that gives you enough time to get between your different appointments. You should park safely and legally and be aware of the traffic hazards when you get in and out of your vehicle. As I get out of my car, um, or get the gear out of the boots and then walk up to the entrance door, I'll take a bit of time to look at the property itself. 
Although this does not formally constitute the start of my inspection, uh, I like to get the feel of the property. It helps me set up what I call an inspection agenda that I follow up during my discussions with the occupier and the inspection itself. In this case, a quick look at the front elevation reveals an uneven PVC guttering and in some places there's a large gap between the edge of the roof slates and the gutters themselves. This could result in gutter leaks and because the walls are of solid brickwork, the problem could quickly result in dampness internally. And that's something I want to be looking at uh, when I'm on the inside. You can also see the base of the front wall has the characteristic drilled holes usually associated with an injected chemical damp proof course. When was this installed and why? Is there an enforceable guarantee? Is there still dampness on the inside face of this wall? If nothing else, this will be something to talk to the occupier about. Now, depending on the type of inspection you're due to carry out, the amount of equipment you need to take into the property can be considerable. But whatever the case, the heaviest item, a single item anyway, is likely to be the sectional or telescopic ladder. And you should always lift this safely without putting undue strain on your back and other muscles. Because a pulled muscle can put you out of action for weeks, so take particular care here. In this first scenario, we have assumed the client has told me the property is empty and I've picked up the keys from the agent. Even though I may have been told the property is empty, I still want to check. The first thing I do is to loudly knock at the door and ring the bell if it's connected. I wait for a short while to give anyone time to get to the door and if I get no response, then I use the key to go in. This may seem overcautious, but although the agent or the owner may think the property is empty, there could still be someone in there. For example, a previous tenant may have innocently misunderstood the date the tenancy ended and will be surprised to hear me letting myself in. Alternatively, squatters may have moved in and it's not unknown for surveyors to disturb thieves helping themselves to scrap metal. I must add, these events are very rare, but it's better to be safe than sorry. Once I'm in the property, I do a number of things. First thing is I shout, hello, anybody home, to announce my presence. Then I make sure the door is locked behind me and I keep the key on me at all times. Although some people say this could slow down my escape if I wanted to get out quickly, I don't want half the neighbourhood joining me in the property because if you leave that door open or unlocked you're bound to get a, a nosy neighbour uh, coming in to see what's going on. I then check every room to make sure I'm on my own. I make sure I see all parts of the room and even check large walk-in cupboards too. And I'm still shouting, hello, anybody at home, in each space. In a large property, this could take several minutes. For example, in this property, there is a poorly lit basement without an electric light. But I always carry my head torch in my pocket, so this poses no particular problem. Once you have done this, make a note of it in your site observation sheets. It could be a standard tick list or just a few sentences about the property and the type of health and safety problems uh, with which you've had to deal with. Um, in effect, it's a rudimentary risk assessment and any auditors or assessors, if you're still in your training period, will find this useful. In this case, I would probably write something like this. Property empty, keys from agent, checked all rooms and spaces, poorly lit basement with uneven stairs, extra care taken, good weather with little wind, so chances of falling debris is minimal, services are on, including the gas, although not all rooms had bulbs. Accessible loft space uh, uh, hatch on first floor landing and the inspection chamber in the rear garden. I'm sure health and safety experts would criticise such a basic approach, but if there are not many risks, then there's not much to say.
This second scenario is similar to the first. I've picked up the keys from the agent, been told the occupier is out, but happy to allow me to carry out my survey unaccompanied. I knock at the door, and in this case, a dog in the house starts to bark. Although this may be the friendliest dog in the world, it's likely to consider the house as its territory. Any stranger going into this environment could be vulnerable to attack. Rather than face this risk, I phone the agent and tell the clients of the problem and let them know that I cannot go ahead with the inspection because of the health and safety risks. I ask them to rearrange the inspection for a time when the dog isn't there or when the dog's owner is there with it. This can create tension between the various parties as it will delay the inspection and possibly the purchase and may even result in an abortive inspection fee. However, you must be clear and refuse to carry out the inspection. I have had agents who told me, just go in, he wouldn't hurt a fly, he's really friendly. I usually respond by inviting the agent to come along to the property and meet the dog personally. And that offer is yet to be taken up. The third scenario assumes the dog owner is there as well. In this case, when the owner answers the door, I say hello and politely ask her to put the dog in another room, at least initially. I stay outside until the dog is safely isolated. I do this for a number of reasons. The initial meeting with the occupier is really important. There is a lot to explain and many questions I want to ask her. I do not want to do this while trying to fend off a barking dog who insists on sniffing those bits you'd rather not have sniffed. Although the vast majority of dogs are friendly and probably wouldn't hurt a fly, you don't know that for sure. I know many practitioners who are confident with dogs and are happy to carry out the inspection with the dog roaming freely. I also know an equal amount who are not willing to take that risk and ask the owner to keep the dog under control at all times. This is a decision you must make. I don't take any chances. I always ask for the dog to be put outside when I'm inside and vice versa when I do the external inspection. This could create tension between you and the occupier, as in my experience, most dog owners simply do not see their own dog's faults even if their own dog is caught chewing on the surveyor's leg. Additionally, the owner or occupier may also be a bit nervous about the inspection anyway. Your findings could affect the sale, so a little tact is called for. I often use the following explanation. Sorry about this, but would it be okay if you keep the dog in a separate room? I'm afraid my company or insurers have a strict health and safety policy and they insist on me following it closely. I hope you understand. If they refuse to comply, then you should consider whether you actually want to go ahead with the inspection or not. Assuming the pack of wild animals have been safely isolated, I spend some time with the occupier, as the information provided can be really helpful. For example, as previously discussed, I would explain who I am, where I come from, uh, and the purpose of my inspection. I also explain what sort of inspection I'll be carrying out, how long it will probably take, and which parts of the home I really want to look in. If appropriate, I ask the occupier if they could open access hatches, move some stored items, uh, and so on. My preference is to ask the occupier to briefly show me around the house. It gives a quick introduction to the property and an opportunity to ask the occupier gentle but probing questions. This could include information about previous repair work and alterations, whether boilers or fires have been regularly serviced, and the cause of any obvious defects that I notice. Once the walkabout is complete, I then politely inform the occupier that I want to carry out the rest of the inspection on my own. Because what you don't want 
is a busybody occupier following you around during the whole time. But this is not the only time I want to talk to the occupier. I usually find the inspection will raise a number of further questions, so I always ask them if I can have a further discussion towards the end of uh, the inspection. And hopefully this approach will get the inspection off on the right foot. I hope you found this video useful and helpful. Um, there are a number of other different sorts of episodes and you might find those of interest as well. And to access these, just go through your normal online account. Thanks for watching.